My name is Mark Henson, and I do some painting and drawing and stuff. But I also like history, and I like I like knowing where I'm coming from, and I like I like we live in crazy times politically, and I like to motivate people to do the right thing because I've been trying to do that ever since I was a, a little punk kid coming down here to the Haight Ashbury in the '60s, and I got kind of uh, aware of our political situation. And it's uh, part of my life's work is to get people aware so that we can do the right thing in, in making a world that we all can live together in harmony and peace and love and you know all that hippie stuff. I truly believe in it. After all these years, I am convinced that it was the right path. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna offer this little talk up as a little bit of history of art and politics and the 60s and where we all come from and all kinds of stuff. So I have a lot of stuff here. I'll probably talk kind of fast. I have like 300 slides to show y'all and get through, so let's go. So visionary art as a catalyst for social change. I, the term visionary art is a little vague. It can mean a whole lot of things. And it, it's, it, lately it kind of means some psychedelic or <coughs> imagery from the inner spaces and stuff is kind of what it is meaning at the moment in the contemporary times. But actually it can mean any, any kind of art where it, an artist has a nice clear vision of what they want to do and just do it without thinking about it or without worrying about whether it's a fine piece of art or anything, they just go for it and make whatever's in their heart to create. So I, I want to take that attitude because we're going to cover a lot of different kinds of art here. And <clears throat> I think even art that doesn't necessarily look psychedelic or cosmic or anything, but gets us motivated to do something good in our lives is as visionary as anything else. So I'm an older guy. You know, I came of age in, in, in the 60s was when I went to high school and stuff. So what we learned back then about art was that art could be anything. So <clears throat> my first slide here is Marcel Duchamp. It was the uh, ready-made, what he called the ready-made, so he just went out and bought this urinal and put it in the gallery, signed his name to it, and said, this is art, folks, 1917. So this became the defining term for how art of the 20th century was, was defined. It was, it's whatever the artist says it is. So it could be anything. So what happened <coughs> was we got kind of commercial <coughs> by the time the 60s rolled out around. Advertising art, this is by Andy Warhol, was kind of like seen as as the equal of any kind of fine art from ages past. <clears throat> so Andy Warhol was one of the exponents of this. So he did these things as silk screens in his art factory in New York City. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the, the pop art movement was what I, when I grew up, this is what I learned art was supposed to be. This is by Wayne Thiebaud, who was one of my teachers in college. Mm -hmm. He did, you know, pictures of candy and pieces of pie and stuff you might see in, in the candy shop, in the counter, and very lush painting, a beautifully done work, but nevertheless, it doesn't really say a whole lot. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein did a lot of artwork based on comic books. His comic books are very popular, and of course they inspired every little kid wanting to be an artist that you first learn how to draw some comics. So his, his work became very popular in the 60s, and Jackson Pollock, and another example of difficult and hard to figure out art, where he would climb on a ladder, and, or get drunk and climb on a ladder and throw paint down on the canvas, making stuff like this. So this is the kind of art I grew up with, and it got to the point where minimalist, you could go buy some stuff at the hardware store, mount it on the wall, and suddenly you're an artist. Mm. And all this art really didn't say much to me. I could appreciate it for what it is, but it really wasn't touching my soul. My attitude was more like these two little kids. <laughs> What's behind the scenes was a lot more interesting than what was on the walls to me usually in, in those days. So that was my, as a, as a beginning artist, <clears throat> this is what I was influenced by until uh, the 60s rolled along and the hippie movement and stuff. So. Things were getting weird. We started out with television and the perfect family. This is Ozzie and Harriet. A few of you might be old enough to remember this TV show, but it was a sitcom about the perfect American family. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we're supposed to look like back then. And here's a Norman Rockwell painting showing also the Thanksgiving dinner with grandma and grandpa and all the family sitting around the table. Nowadays, they'd all be doing this you know, with McDonald's in front of them. Mm -hmm. So this was the ideal. And here's our 
plastic version of the American family, the Barbie doll family, which is also our, our ideal. And <clears throat> it was a automotive society. Everything was powered by gasoline and the age of suburbia. And you could drive to the restaurant and the drive up window and the girls with roller skates would come up and give you your burger and stuff. So this is what, this is what when Trump says we wanna get back to make America great again, these are, this is what he's talking about. And to all of us who grew up in this, it was like kind of boring and stupid. We were looking for anything else that was more fun because what was really going on behind the scenes was there was the threat of atomic war. Mm -hmm. And this was the Cold War and we, there were alarm systems and every, every week the sirens would go off to test out the alarms and people were building fallout shelters in their backyards. And so actually we were living in fear that we were gonna blow ourselves up with these evil weapons. So you can protect yourself from radioactive fallout. Well, not really. The propaganda was trying to tell us, convince us that we could survive a war with Russia or anybody else that had atomic weapons and, and that everything would be okay. So little kids, they taught us, well, you know, if the bomb goes off while you're at school, just crawl under your desk, duck and cover, you'll be okay. <laughs> but actually these horrible weapons, here's a couple pictures. This is a, a test where they, they blew up a bunch of ships out in the South Pacific to see its destructive power in that sense. And here's another fireball. So this is the most fearsome thing that mankind has ever created to kill ourselves with. And we were living in direct fear of this back then. So all of this beautiful, perfect American society stuff was really a sham. And we, as young teenagers, started to figure this out. So after a little while, we got in a real war. It's, it's not an atomic war, but a war in Vietnam mm -hmm. when young men were susceptible to the draft where the, the government could say, okay, you're in the army, you're going to war. And if you didn't, they'd take you to jail. So a lot of young men got drafted and went to this, whether they liked it or not. And so here's a, a battle underway, helicopters and men, and here's the local people hiding out in a ditch, hoping that all this will go away soon. And here's our boys, you know, somebody's getting hauled off in the helicopter. Hopefully they're not gonna die, but a lot of them did. And that looked like this, they came home in boxes. <clears throat> and back then, the newspaper reporters had access to all of this stuff. The army was happy to let them tag along and take pictures or videos of anything they wanted. And so nowadays that's, that's gone. They realize that this is gonna make people anti-war. They're gonna see the blood and guts and stuff and not support the war. So they, they put the nicks on that. Now it's very tightly controlled. But back then you could actually see their, your, your kids coming home in boxes. <clears throat> As far as the local people goes, this is the result of a napalm attack, a famous picture. The, the, the little girl here was horribly disfigured. She's still alive today to talk about it. <clears throat> and so this is the result of uh, you know, our troops attacking a small village. And of course, these people are fleeing in terror. The ones that didn't make it ended up like this. This is the My Lai Massacre, where American troops killed uh, somewhere between three and 500 villagers one day. Just went on a killing spree until finally a helicopter pilot saw what was going on, landed his chopper and had his guys train the helicopter's machine guns on our American troops and told them to knock it off or he's gonna shoot them. And they did and they did a big scandal ensued, but the, the guy who ordered this massacre ended up getting like a three month jail sentence and got off. So this is, this, but we, we all saw this and this made us very, very, very much against this evil war. So the movement to resist the draft started up. And so kids started burning their draft <coughs> cards and refusing to go, whether jail or not. So a lot of young people fled to Canada or other foreign countries and, or, or maybe survived the jail or hid out from the FBI <coughs> here in the States. Eventually the draft kind of turned into a lottery and they, nobody was gonna serve, people were avoiding it anyway and they, they eventually you know, they sort of fizzled out as far as anybody wanting to go. So there were a lot of protests and here's somebody with some good common sense. <laughs> it, a lot better, the soldiers, actually a lot of them did take acid and realized that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and wanted to get out of there. But meanwhile, <clears throat> while we were protesting all this stuff going on, there were a lot of con confrontations, usually on college campuses or sometimes in the city streets. So here's the National Guard facing off against the hippies. They had guns and bayonets and we had flowers and maybe a 
couple of brownies or a little join or two to give the soldiers because they weren't really our enemies. These were our older brothers a lot of times. They were even a guy, our best friend, that got drafted in the army. So it wasn't, we, they were ordered to keep us from protesting, but these were actually our brothers. So how to communicate and let them know that we were no harm, we putting the flowers in the barrels of the gun was kind of a symbolic act. You would face the, the possibility of death to give a little peace to these guys. However, sometimes they did shoot. This is Kent State, Ohio, mm -hmm. and uh, at May 4th, 1970, <clears throat> where the National Guard did kill four college students, who some of whom weren't even involved in a protest. They were just on their way to class. So here's, here's this girl, her friend has been shot, and of course, horrified. And this, this is where we learned that our government was willing to kill us to keep evil occurring. And it made a big impression on all the youth of America, and we sort of reacted like this. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> this is pretty much sums up the attitude of youth towards the war and towards authority. And here's a little poster that was going around then that states it very nicely and simply. So this was pretty much our philosophy. <clears throat> At the same time as you know, kids going into the army, there was a, a struggle for civil rights and free speech on campuses, free speech in the streets of our cities. Black people in particular were very underserved and treated like garbage and, and they were often drafted and sent to fight these wars and they had no civil rights, you know, they had to drink in a separate water fountain or sit in the back of the bus and all the things that are kind of cliche now, but if you had to live this life, it was horrible. So <clears throat> Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer, he was drafted and refused to go. They took his boxing title of world champion away and, and he just, his attitude was, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. Those Viet Congs never did anything to me. Why do I want to go kill people that are colored people in another country? He refused. And that motivated a lot of black people to resist. And they also had their famous leader, Martin Luther King, who preached in a, take a tone of nonviolence that we would, they would achieve their civil rights through activism and working and convincing rather than through the use of force but force prevailed and he was assassinated, possibly by the FBI. Mm -hmm. So here he is in his coffin. And as a result of this, a lot of black people did decide that maybe making a big stink or a little riot or a little violence maybe was gonna be what it took to get people to see what they were going through. So there were riots in Chicago and Baltimore. Here's a couple scenes from these cities where they burned down city blocks and fought the police and it, it's really crazy for a couple of weeks there's a big a big uh, something San Francisco about got burned there was a big thing here I remember I was in the city when it happened watching the smoke come up from down in the Fillmore area so out of this was born the Black Panther Party in Oakland this is Huey Newton and Bobby Seale two of the founding members and they decided that they would carry arms openly to protect themselves from the police while they were activating the community to get together. And so they were regarded as terrorists and there were some incidents where they were shot at and killed and where they shot back and killed and most of them ended up in jail, but not all. And they were able to successfully initiate uh, some community programs of educating their children and feeding the children in Oakland and actually did a, a very good amount of community work to build the black community there. And uh, they were a little, a little uh, sexist at first, but Angela Davis, one of their female members, set them straight right away and forced them to adopt an, an equal rights for all sexes platform as part of their attitude. So the Black Panthers became quite powerful, spread across the United States. An attack against one is an attack against all. And they did put the fear into the police and the police did leave them alone and the black community did get a whole lot more power and, and, and it actually this joining together worked. So they had their own propaganda department. This is Emory Douglas who did posters and propaganda for them for their newspapers. So here's a couple of his pieces. So these you can see if you're in the East Bay wandering around, the Black Panthers were, were pretty visible. So <clears throat> between them and the hippies, we're fighting for building up rights for everybody. 
And we realized we had allies in these people. As, as a bunch of white punk kids looking to have some freedom from the army, we could sympathize with these guys wanting some freedom from racism. So we sort of united our energies for making some social change. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the bus came by. This character, Ken Kesey, <clears throat> was going to school down in Stanford, and he worked in the psychiatric hospital and found out about this stuff called LSD. And he was able to get his hands on some and even meet up with a character, Stanley Osley, who knew how to make the stuff. <clears throat> so he got together his friends and they painted up this bus and they took it across the United States and back and everywhere they stopped, they would have a kind of crazy rock and roll party and bust out a garbage can full of Kool-Aid laced with LSD and serve it up to whoever showed up. So like Johnny Appleseed to the East Coast and back, they spread the psychedelic culture and planted the seeds for this in the United States. They had some parties called Acid Tests. Here's a flyer for one, where all the kids that could figure out what this poster was about would go and show up and you could bring whatever your creative thing was, your guitar, your sculpture, some poetry, whatever you like to do, you could show up and do it. Be part of, this is a, a no audience type situation. Everybody's a participant. And <clears throat> So this kind of got, got the whole thing fired up here on the West Coast as far as crazy psychedelic energy and <coughs> the idea that through this new thing we were discovering we could make a new world and create our own society. <coughs> Another character, Timothy Leary, on the East Coast was kind of doing the same thing. He was an academic, uh, a, psych a psychologist working at uh, Harvard, I believe and they were, had some LSD studies going on there that were actually funded by the CIA to try to develop LSD as a weapon. And Dr. Tim got his hands on some and realized its potential as a psychological tool for healing us psychologically, that it, by having sessions that are monitored by a trained psychologist, people could work through their psychological problems and sometimes find a creative solution and, and come out whole. So he started a place at Millbrook where he rented this big old house and this is where they had their sessions. And they, he took, so he took kind of a clinical approach while Kesey took the party approach. And between these two extremes we were able to cover a whole lot of attitudes so it sort of opened the world to these things. So uh, people that were like-minded people who were by this time known as the hippies started getting together en masse and having events in San Francisco, not just the acid test, but other people decided this was a good idea. So things like the TRIPS Festival were organized, which is, looked like this. They rented a hall and put on a light show and had these crazy parties and it sort of woke up all of the hippies in San Francisco to the power of unity that if we got together enough people we could do something really powerful and create a space where we all felt like we could be ourselves without any kind of fear of oppression. So the gathering of the tribes happened and it became a huge thing where 30 or 40,000 people showed up in the park down there in the polo fields and had an impromptu party and nobody knew it was going to end up like this, but it was entirely peaceful, nobody got hurt, no fights, nobody got arrested, nobody died, everybody had a wonderful day out in the sunshine listening to all the big San Francisco bands who were just, you know, garage bands at that time. They weren't known. And so this realized that, you know, 40,000 of us in one place, we can really make a difference here. So the hippies started infesting this neighborhood up the street because rents were cheap and there are these lovely Victorian houses that you could infest as hippies, you know, 20 people could live in one house and so everybody could live cheap and in these beautiful places and, and sort of take over this neighborhood. So that's what they did. Here's the famous corner of Hayden Ashbury at the time and you can see all the hippies just kind of hanging out, enjoying themselves. This is artist Robert Crumb's version of what it looked like. He's out here with his wife, pregnant wife, selling his comic book, hoping to make a few bucks, and, and you can get an idea of <laughs> how it all worked. <clears throat> there were a few little stores opened up that were selling, you know, hippie stuff, you know, your pipes and your incense and your Indian bedspreads, and these 
posters and artwork that was not like anything seen before. And out on the streets of the Haight-Ashbury, occasionally they'd roll a flatbed truck out in the intersection and block off the road and guys like the Grateful Dead would show up and fill the streets for 10 blocks down with people having a wonderful good time. So this thrived here for a few years. Of course, you know, things like this are too good to last. So it expanded and moved out. So how this got going and was publicized, there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there was the only way you could communicate was either by print medium or word of mouth, pretty much, or call somebody on a telephone. So how did you get everybody together to do stuff? Well, underground newspapers started coming up. So San Francisco had its version called the Oracle. New York had its version called the East Village Other. And these publications would, guys like Robert Crumb on the street corner would be standing around waving these newspapers and for 50 cents or a buck you could buy one and you'd learn everything about where stuff was going on and where to go and who to meet and where the cool places were to hang out and what the good radio stations were. And philosophy, all these, these publications printed a lot of stuff, political activists, information which at the time was regarded as conspiracy theory but in time turned out to be mostly true and uh, <clears throat> and maybe religious philosophy I myself got interested in yoga and meditation from reading an article in one of these magazines by a Swami the Catholic Church had this magazine called Ramparts and they were very what you would call liberal even radically minded politically this is Stanley Mouse one of the poster artists they did a big article on the hippies there's Wes Wilson's introductory page for the, for the hippie article. And they did a lot of stuff about wars and, and various political situations. It was a great magazine for finding out the real story about political things. <clears throat> Over in Berkeley, we had the Berkeley Barb, which was uh, ostensibly a college newspaper. But this, you can get the idea here, <laughs> what they were really all about. And they were, they were filled with all kinds of radical political stories and stuff. So eventually all, all of this movement of people here in the city and elsewhere, it grew nationally, got the attention of the, the bigger world. This Saturday Evening Post was a regular mainstream magazine, came a weekly magazine, picture and article magazine. So they were trying to figure out, well, what's this all about, you know, and, and letting mainstream America know that, you know, there was some really weird stuff going on here. We don't know what it is, but we don't really like it, you know, it's kind of weird. It's it seems kinda, you're having too much fun. Right? Yeah, would you want your son to look like this? I don't think so. But we, they wanted to know about it, and Life Magazine, kind of a compadre to post, did an article, this is in 1966, March of 66, on LSD and the exploding threat of the mind drug that got out of control. Well, yes, and this, art <laughs> this article helped a lot because all of the kids in all the high schools across America saw this magazine and looked at that and looked at the pictures inside and said, wow, where can I get some? <laughs> and a few months later, they had this one, another one about LSD and LSD art, where they showed all the rock and roll posters and some crazy environments the artists had made and stuff and light shows and the, the things the hippies were doing. And this one really put it over the top for me as a personally. I was able to convince my parents that, hey, I want to paint my bedroom. If you guys just buy me the paint, I'll do all the work. And they said, okay, and they gave me 20 bucks or so, and I went out and bought some fluorescent green paint and some black paint and painted my room a bunch of swirly psychedelic stuff. And my parents, of course, were horrified. <laughs> but a few years later, you know, my mom's friends were, can we go see your son's room? I heard it's really weird. My mom was giving tours. So <clears throat> anyway, this went mainstream enough that hippie art appeared on the cover of Playboy magazine and uh, at the other end of the extremes, Mad magazine. So this is from 68, a couple years later, but it, it, Turn on, tune in, drop dead. Drop dead. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman, well, he needs a haircut and, you know, maybe a shave. And still the same old guy. So uh, this whole psychedelic art thing, it hit the streets in a big way. You could walk up and down the street here and in every shop window, there would be posters like this one advertising uh, the human being or any other event. These things would be in the windows or 
uh, stapled to foam poles, and they usually didn't last very long because people really liked them, and the only way you could really get one was to rip it off the foam pole or ask a store owner if you could take it out of the window. <coughs> So the, this, this hippie art was appearing, and also it started coming out as comic books. Robert Crumb started this one, Zap Comics. This is issue number zero. And he, he of course, became famous for things like <coughs> Keep on Trucking and Mr. Natural, and became a, a very well-known and respected That's artist. That's really what he looks like, by the way. The, the guy that was Mr. Natural's model. Uh, so no, the real oh, we got this one again. Didn't mean to put it in there twice. So basically the essence of all of this publication stuff was we were gonna horrify regular <laughs> America and, and seduce their daughters. This is, yeah, so this, this uh, says it all quite, quite completely. So this is, this is the beginning of what is now known as the culture war because the guys, these guys were so horrified by this guy that, that um, it had to do something about it, you know. We have to legislate or pass some rules or you know get this under control or something. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of these hippies started making posters. The advertise rock and roll and music was an integral part of this whole world. There were a lot of good musicians running around, forming bands and breaking up and jamming and stuff. So the very first really official rock and roll poster of the psychedelic era is known as The Seed, and it was made for this band called The Charlatans, who didn't play here in San Francisco, they played in Nevada City, Nevada. But this is the first poster Virginia they call it, huh? Virginia City. Virginia City, sorry. Yeah. She knows, who's the expert, she was there. <clears throat> Anyway, they played the Red Dog Saloon, which is still there, sort of, yeah. and, uh, and they, this was the start. They came back to San Francisco, and all these other guys started making posters for the rock and roll shows. These are known as the Big Five, uh, the most well-known ones. We have Alton Kelly, uh, Victor Moscoso, Rick Griffin, Wes Wilson, and Stanley Mouse. And Stanley and Wes and... Uh, Victor are still alive. The other two have passed on, unfortunately. And these guys started out very simply with pictures like this. Very, you know, pen and ink drawings were done up as posters for the various bands playing around town. But pretty soon, the promoters decided to spring for color, and the artists learned their business with the graphic arts a little better. This is a Wes Wilson one. This one also. And this one also. So these things started getting more elaborate. He used his wife for the model of this one. This is another artist who wasn't in the Big Five, Lee Conklin, who I very much like his stuff. is very psychedelic. This one was later reworked as an album cover for Carlos Santana, oh. which you might remember. And here's yes. another one by him. And another one by Lee. So his stuff was really nicely weird. Stanley Mouse is well known and alive to this day. He lives up, uh, up by in uh, Sebastopol now, has a studio there. So this is probably his most famous thing ever. And uh, if you were lucky enough to have one of these in mint condition right now, it's worth about $50,000. And it wasn't sold at auction recently for that price. So uh, it used to be you just, you know, go get it in a store window. <laughs> So St Stanley is very pro prolific, and he, he used a lot of Art Nouveau motifs. This was actually based on an Alphonse Moucha picture from the turn of the century that he reworked. He would do this quite a bit. And this, here's another one by Stanley. And, and this one here, he often used photographs as some inspiration. <coughs> Victor Moscoso, living down in the Mission, he, does, he was very good with this using his colors to create this optical thing, by like picking the right colors, complementary colors of similar value, your eyes can't quite focus. So he was really good at using this method to create very psychedelic effects in a very simple way. So here's some of Victor's pieces. And this one's based on a painting by Van Gogh. So a lot of these artists are, were aware of their art history and where, where their provenance, where they were coming from, who their ancestors were. So this is showing some respect to that. <clears throat> Sometimes they collaborated. This is, this is one by Victor Mosco. So uh, that this one here is by Rick Griffin. This one's by Rick Griffin, another guy. And uh, this one here is another one, almost as famous as that Grateful Dead one. One of these will probably set you back thirty or $40,000 if you're lucky enough to get one. 
Here's another piece by him. I, I, I myself was very inspired by him because he's a meticulous technician and, and I just love his imagination as well. So sometimes these artists collaborated. This one is a combination of Victor Moscoso and Rick Griffin worked together on this one. <clears throat> Same story with this one here. And this one here. I saw that show. This one here? <laughs> here, I'll go the back. You, look, you saw Jimmy here? Yes. You lucky this dog. You lucky dog. With so Dino. jealous. You don't put everybody to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, who, who don't, you know, be there for Jimmy. <laughs> and the Buddy Miles Express. So sometimes these artists work together. This one, all five of the big five work together on this piece. It's kind of a, this came out in 87? Uh, yeah, a few years, 20 years later. As a, as a celebrate 20 years uh, anniversary of the Summer of Love, they all worked together to create this poster. So once things got a little more organized, you didn't have to rip them off of phone poles. You could actually go into a poster store. This one is the Berkeley Bonaparte, which was over on University Avenue, or not University, over on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, <coughs> where you could buy these things off the wall for a, a dollar or two. And some of these artists became well known enough that the record industry and mainstream advertising and commercial artists were realizing that this was something new and exciting. So Robert Crumb got to do this <laughs> album cover for Big Brother. Stanley Mouse and Alton Kelly got to do this one for The Grateful Dead. Rick Griffin did this one for The Grateful Dead. So in a way, these things that started out as completely underground got into the mainstream. This stuff still goes on, <clears throat> lives today. Dave Hunter, who recently passed on, is a marvelous poster artist. So these, these two are by him. Frank Kozik, who's a local hero here, did a lot of stuff for grunge bands and the like in the punk, post-punk era. And he also is politically active. So here's one for Neil Young, but he's actually giving a nod to Native Americans. He also does some sculpture. And so this is some Chinese guy. <laughs> you know, and he's, <laughs> he, did, he did a series of like Stalin and Mao Zedong and he did a bunch of uh, famous dictators <coughs> as sculptures. Chuck Sperry, who has also got some of his pieces on the wall here and is going to have an opening for his blotter art tomorrow night. It, it has, runs a silk screen shop here in San Francisco. He's a very marvelous poster artist. So here's one he did for uh, Operation Ceasefire, an effort to stop the war in Iraq. He did this one last year for the Women's March, you know, where everybody's wearing their pink hats. This was a poster that they, they printed up thousands of these and gave them out at the event. Another artist I like, uh, his, it goes by the name of Emek. He does all kinds of different things, mostly for rock and roll bands, but a lot of his stuff has political content. So these are ones I particularly like. Here's your guys on the treadmill here, making the gears turn. And here's our death dictator, you know, preaching to the mindless masses. His, his work is wonderful. He's from up by Seattle way. And uh, some of these guys are making these blotter acids we see around here. This is one by Chuck Sperry. Mm -hmm. This is one by Alex Gray, who is probably the most well-known of the visionary artists. And you can see a large version, but the small version there is also quite collectible if you are collecting these things. So I myself have been lucky enough to be called upon every now and then to make one of these posters. So I like to emulate the old school guys because I grew up with these posters and I learned a lot about graphic arts and how to make these things by just looking at their posters and figuring out how they did stuff. <clears throat> so these are done digitally, but you get the idea. I was trying to st stay true to the old style of way of coloring. This one I did just last year for the Summer of Love 50th anniversary celebration in Golden Gate Park that couldn't get a permit, so it never happened. The yes. city here somehow didn't respect the, one of the best things that ever happened in this history of San Francisco, which was this whole hippie thing, put this city on the map in some ways, and they wouldn't give a permit for us to have a party in the park. Everything was organized. It was all a go, except somebody in City Hall that preferred to have soccer teams out on the field wouldn't allow this to happen. <clears throat> so I don't want to whine too much about that. <clears throat> Who is? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, maybe someday they'll let us do it again. I don't know. So 
visionary origins. Visionary art is art that's about your inner worlds or to explore psychic space or cosmic space or where you're influenced by divine energy or something. It can be a lot of different things. The essence of it here is a little picture by Rick Griffin where the divine spirit is inspiring Bob's big boy from the burger restaurants to with an artistic inspiration. There's the brilliant idea that God or whoever is giving him the idea and he's manifesting it on paper. So this is what we do as artists. It shows the, the process psychically and divinely where it comes from and what we're supposed to do with it. So this of course has been going on for centuries and centuries so I'm going to show you some old stuff. This is the uh, Isenheim altarpiece painted by Matthias Grunewald in oh, about 1500 or so. A, pi a picture I've always loved because it shows the Christ-like being rising above a world of war and hate, which is what we all want to do. So this, you know, somebody back then had the right idea and was trying to promulgate this. It hangs in a church. So hopefully the people that saw this picture maybe were inspired to, to live the life that Christians are supposed to live as opposed to fighting and killing each other. Another artist from old times is uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder. And he did a lot of local scenery, village scenes. So you could, if you see his paintings, you can go back to 1450 and imagine you're there and see every, all the things people are doing, their daily lives and everything. But this one, he did in particular to show the forces of the plague that came around. Mm -hmm. So the forces of death, war, and plague are rounding up the humans, killing them off, and shoving them in a little box, and packing them off to hell or somewhere. An awesome picture that, because there's so much crazy stuff going on, it, it, it's irresistible to somebody like me that likes weird stuff. And another artist of those days was Aeronymus Bosch. This is from his famous piece, The Garden of Earthly Delights. It's just a small detail. But you can see the amazing power of imagination this fellow had. And uh, every artist is entirely jealous that we can't just think of this stuff all the time. So he is a big inspiration to all anybody that calls himself a visionary artist because this guy was a true visionary. He saw this stuff and painted it. <clears throat> Moving up a few centuries, we have William Blake, about 1750 in England, who was kind of a reclusive guy that hung out with him and his wife and stayed home and made art most of the time. And he, he was a very mystical kind of Christian, <clears throat> knew all the arcane stuff about Christians and the angels and all the energy. This is God creating the world. And he, God here is a scientist or a mathematician. He's being very precise with an instrument creating the world. So th it's not just haphazard, He's, it's by divine design. And here's one of the angels. I forget which one he is, but he's, he's leading us into the light. Okay, moving up a little more. Yeah, this is Jean Delville. He's from about 1870. And he had these wonderful, crazy images. This is called Satan's Treasures. And it's a little hard to see here, but I guess old Satan there is standing over this crazy chain of beings and they're swirling off into some kind of damnation. He, had, he was a, very much a mystic and had his own mystical society that he worked with, kind of like theosophists or something, kind of a little cult. Here's another piece by him. Wonderful stuff. He had a, a, a big exhibition in Brussels last year. Another artist who, at the same time period, was a, a graphic artist, uh, Gustave Doré. Mostly he drew stuff right on a block of stone and then the lithographers would come in and, and work it over to make prints or he would draw directly on a wood block or a metal sheet <coughs> and engravers would, would make this stuff and he would print them out. He, would, he did Bibles, he did uh, uh, the uh, Dante's Inferno. He, he was basically an illustrator, but his sense of the, the mystic and divine and making his images have life was extremely good. Another one from the same time, Gustave Moreau, living in Paris, made these, this is John the Baptist, the apparition of John the Baptist's head before Salome. She had him executed on a whim, just because she could, and he's coming back to haunt her. And Gustave Moreau is kind of a, 
a natural born crazy guy. I actually have been to his studio in France and seen his work where you can see all these pieces in his big beautiful house. He was, had a little money in his family so he had a big house in Paris that he filled up with this stuff. And the upper floor was all one big art studio. It was an amazing place. So if you ever go there, check this place out. So here's another one of his more complicated pieces and uh, showing you know, divine spirits and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I have to give a nod to the next group to come along a little later in time. This is about 1870, 1880. These guys were called the, the pre-Raphaelites. And I don't want to try to explain all of that, but they did a lot of art based on Arthurian legend and old Viking tales and Shakespearean stories. So this is the Lady of Shalott from an Arthurian legend. And this is Ophelia from Hamlet, the play by Shakespeare. This is by John Everett Millay. Uh, the last one here, oh, got to tell you who it was. John Waterhouse painted this one. Marvelous paintings, very detailed, very rich, very sumptuous, full of all kinds of magic and mystical stuff. I love these guys. So moving up to the 20th century, you know, at the turn of the century we had urinals. Well, there was some reaction to that. Surrealism, a movement based on art and imagery and things that you see in your dreams. Your dreams are irrational. Stuff comes and goes. You don't know what it's all about, but to paint a picture about it might be interesting. So Salvador Dali became the foremost proponent of surrealism. This one is called Persistence of Memory and a famous piece because of the limp watches and time is a vague thing. And we've got a melted face here. It's kind of hard to tell, but that's what it is. <coughs> And uh, he, this is another one called the Hallucinogenic Toreador. This is made towards the end of his life, but sums up a lot about those who like psychedelics can relate to this picture quite well, because it forms all kinds of things. If you look at it right, you see a lot of things besides what's immediately apparent. So these guys were kind of my influences, artists I liked and respected when I was trying to figure out what I was doing in life. And uh, as time went on, when I was a teenager, my good buddy in Sacramento had a little money. He subscribed to this magazine from New York City called Avant Garde Magazine. And inside were all kinds of articles about a variety of different things. But they always had features, two or three photographic features about artwork. And here's one of their, here's the Avant Garde cover. Here's another one. This one is by George Tooker. And I immediately liked this because in our American society, we were all kind of separate from each other, living in our own little boxes. Mm -hmm. So his, his work, here's another piece by George, kind of showed the isolation and the loneliness of our society, that we were you know, going through our lives but not really relating to each other, kind of as automatons or in our own little private world but not really relating. This magazine was full of good art. So this one's by Ernest Fuchs, who is the leader of what is known today as the visionary or the uh, magic realism school of Vienna. An um, amazing guy. He lived to be 85 years old. He died just a couple of years ago. I uh, was fortunate enough to meet him briefly before he died. And he's the mentor to any of the European fantastic artists worship him as their granddaddy. Mm -hmm. a, a crazy guy, he used to run around in town in one of his three Rolls Royces uh, with, uh, filled with beautiful women and drinking champagne and carousing around town. And uh, of course the local conservatives hated him for all this because he was kind of putting it in their faces. But he actually was so respected that when he died they gave him a funeral in the biggest cathedral in Vienna. A full, full, fancy funeral. This magazine had another artist, D. S. Schwartberger, who I've also had the good fortune to meet and see his studio. And he does more abstract things these days, but he did a lot of these very precise and, and weird, what we call visionary art now. So these are the guys I saw when I was back when I was like 14 and 15. That kind of let me know that I could you know, if I could aspire to be anywhere near as good at, at, at bringing my imaginary ideas to life as these guys, that I, I would be happy. This is Robert Venosa, who was a, a student of Salvador Dali. I got to hang out with him and learn from him for a number of years. And he also studied with Mr. Fuchs. And 
uh, Mati Clairwein was also in the same kind of gang in Europe. And this one, of course, you all know from the Santana album, Abraxas, that yeah. the Abraxas album, which Robert Venosa, the guy we're just looking at, did the lettering for. And um, Mati Clairwein had a, he had a studio in New York City and he hung out with, with you know, Andy Warhol, all the, all the glitterati of New York were his friends. So he made this room full of his paintings that was kind of like a chapel that you could go in and look, all, it's covered floor, walls and ceiling with his artwork. And it became so famous that it was any rock star in town. It was kind of like you had to go see this place. Mm -hmm. So he got to know Jimi Hendrix and Miles Davis and all the famous mm -hmm. stars of the day. And Miles particularly liked him and had him do a, a couple of album covers. But this is the most famous one for the album Bitches Brew, one of his jazz double albums. If you ever listen to it, it's if you like Miles, this is the one you want to listen to. And he also did another piece for uh, Jerry Garcia later on. So these, are, these were my inspirations. And aside from these trained artists, there were a few other things I liked, such as art by crazy people. This is by Lewis Wayne, who slowly but surely went nuts. And he, he was a cat fanatic. So he did many, many, many pictures of cats. He started out with little illustrations for like child's books where the cats are happily playing and having little tea parties and stuff. By the time he got older and crazier, they were these very, very psychedelic abstract kitties. <clears throat> so here's, here's one of them. So don't feed your cat LSD, you guys. It's not a good idea. <clears throat> Another crazy artist, this guy's William Kurilek. And this, this, uh, this painting I came across in a, a book, a Time Life Books made this book in, uh, I don't know, back in the 60s. It was all about psychology and the mind. The book was called The Mind. And this was an illustration in this book that I spent days looking at this picture where the guy's laying out in a wheat field. It's hard to see and his head's cracked open and inside his head are all these little rooms and these are the things going on in his mind. It's, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's, there's all kinds of nutty stuff. Not all of it's pleasant. So I, I, I'm not sure about his life or anything, but this picture was a big influence on me on wanting to make crazy art. <laughs> At the same time, over here in San Francisco, at the San Francisco Art Institute, there was this group that turned out to be called the California Visionaries. And they were, go these were students and teachers together there were kind of working in cohesion to make a lot of really fantastically beautiful art. This is by Bill Martin, who was there. And back in the day, these artists were collected, well not collected, there was a guy who decided he could print them up as posters and sell them. Tom Burke, who now runs Pomegranate Press, a giant publishing company. So he printed up these art by these guys and stuck them around all the little poster stores and record stores. And it worked pretty well because his company was a big success. But he brought these guys to the world. And this poster here, if you didn't have any rock and roll posters, you wanted to collect these ones. So when you were high in your little get high den back then, you could look at these posters, stare at them all day and be fascinated. So here's a couple by Bill. There's another one. And another artist of the same type was Gage Taylor, who liked to do these fantasy kind of landscapes. Uh, another artist in this group was, was uh, oh gosh, I don't have his last name here, Joseph Parker. <laughs> and he did these things, this piece, it's probably 10 or 12 feet across. He did these giant, giant pieces, usually with a big sunset, very colorful. And another artist in the group was Thomas Akawi, uh, Japanese American. And he, although he was Japanese, he liked Egypt. So a lot of his iconography was Egyptian and he was a master with the airbrush. So these are airbrush paintings, mm -hmm. freehand and stencil airbrush. And this is the first time I really saw a very good airbrush painting, which inspired me to learn how to do that at some point. Another artist in this group is Nick Hyde, who right now has a retrospective exhibition going on in Lake County, where I'm from. And he's probably not going to be with us a whole lot longer. He was very frail. He was there. But he did these really crazy psychedelic stuff. This one's from the 60s. This is his girlfriend, Beth. And how she maybe looked to him while he was tripping very hard. <clears throat> Not all these guys were guys. This is Josie Grant, a woman here in San Francisco, 
who was one of the stronger women artists at the time, and she still is active here in the city and has a business making murals. She's got one down in Chinatown and a bunch of other places in town here. I'm not sure where they all are. She's still busy doing stuff. What's her name? Josie Grant. If you, you can Google her up and you'll see some stuff. And another guy who's not in that, but I'm going to show you a few that are like not from the, San, the California Visionary Group, but so inspired by these guys who came along a little bit later. This is Garrett Moore, who lives over in Hayward now. This is one of his pieces. He did a lot of illustrations for NASA. This one is by Katherine Andrews, a woman who lives in Los Angeles, who does, as, as this stuff morphed into what they called New Age art, you know, like fairies and dolphin kind of stuff a little more. These guys were a little more idealized. So this is a romantic one by Catherine Andrews. Here's a landscape by Bruce Ricker, lives down in Carmel. He's a very meticulous artist. This thing is probably only about this big. <clears throat> it's not so big, but very elaborate, lush, beautiful places that we all want to move to. <laughs> yes. <sighs> Another guy kind of like that, Jeffrey Bedrick, does a lot of fantasy stuff, but he also ended up doing a lot of illustration work for Disney. So he's, he's still around. I think he lives in Marin somewhere. This one is by a good friend of mine, Paul Nicholson. He's living up in Sebastopol Way. And he does a lot of large paintings, often with kind of now you see it, now you don't stuff. And I think I have this one twice, so we're going to... Oh, I got... That was a mistake, folks. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into the political part of this. So art meets politics. And some of the, in the, a few hundred years ago, there wasn't any political art. It was all, you know, done for rich patrons, kings and queens and princes, and, or portraits of famous people, or landscapes, or Greek mythology, or stuff from the Bible, or art for churches. So one of the first guys that did strictly political stuff, an Englishman by the name of William Hogarth. This is 1751. This is Gin Lane in London, and this was a commentary on the fact that gin had recently been invented. It cost nothing. It, there weren't any laws about drinking or prohibitions or anything, so large segments of the London population were drinking themselves to death daily. So this was his comment, Gin Lane, where you can see the drunken mom or babies falling over the stairway. The buildings are falling apart in the background from lack of maintenance. There's, there is swindling and pickpocketing going along and somebody's dead in the background in their coffin. And it was, was kind of like the uh, methadrine epidemic of today, only it was alcohol back then. Around the turn of the century back then, this is uh, by Francisco Goya. This picture is called the 3rd of May, 1908. And he painted this picture in a reaction to Napoleon's troops coming into Spain and conquering Spain. And the local people on the 2nd of May, they resisted in Madrid and killed some French soldiers. So the French decided to take some revenge. So they rounded up a few hundred people, lined them up against the wall and shot them. Mr. Goya perhaps even witnessed this. Uh, we're not sure about that, but this powerful painting was made in response to Napoleon's invasion. So this is purely a political commentary on the injustices of war. So there, it's a very interesting piece because you see the expressions of these different people's faces from defiance to fear. The priest is cowering in fear. The other guys are kind of like, why me? What did I do? Anyway, it's a very strong piece. It's, it's a huge painting. It's about 12 feet across. You can see it in the Prado Museum in Madrid if you ever go there. Over in France, uh, Honor Daumier uh, was one of the first political cartoonists where he actually drew cartoons for publication in newspapers. But this piece is called The Uprising. So uh, not too different from Paris of right now, except for these guys aren't wearing the green vests. But a similar idea that people were going to rise up and demand their rights or whatever. And so he, this piece is about that. He did a lot of political cartoons lampooning the regimes. And after Napoleon, they went through a few kings and then another Napoleon and then some more kings. They couldn't quite figure out that they wanted to be a republic yet. So he had a lot of food for political cartooning and stuff. 
over in London at the time of Charles Dickens. This is by uh, Augustus Edwin Mulready called The Uncared For. And it's very sentimental, but when we hear about the poor little batch girl and starving children in the streets, it was a reality back then. Thousands of people froze to death every winter. And, and little kids were left out, you know, orphaned or kicked out of their houses or their, their home life was so abusive they had to run. So here these two kids are trying to survive on the streets while in the background a poster is proclaiming the triumph of Christianity. <clears throat> so there's a bit of sarcasm involved. <clears throat> George Gross, a little bit later, in the German Expressionist period in the 30s between the, the, the two world wars, uh, did a lot of political commentary. This one here is kind of a similar theme. This is the poor starving small person and the rich guy, the fat cat, he's got it all here. This is uh, holding it all in and not sharing anything, champagne on the table, and he's got all his money and stuff. That's how it was, <clears throat> how it is still. This is another piece by him where he's commenting on, these are the veterans of World War I, crippled and living on the streets, dogs fighting for dogs for their food, and prostitutes trying to lead them on and the rich people living the jazz age life <clears throat> and, and the contrast between the rich and the poor. Another one of the German expressionists was Otto Dix. This is his piece showing um, trench warfare in World War I, the horrors of war and how evil and bad it was. So the, it, it, Germany actually, while they, they organized World War I, it all happened in France. None of the fighting took place in Germany. So he wanted to show the German people what the, actually they had given the world and how horrifying it was. And Pablo Picasso, when the Spanish Revolution happened, it was the first time that anyone was bombed aerially with seriousness. The German Air Force doing the bidding of Francisco Franco, who was trying to take Spain away from uh, any kind of democratic ideals. They bombed the town of Guernica and killed a lot of people and this was Pablo's. Pablo was a communist. He wasn't gonna have any of this. He moved to France and painted this picture and said he was never going back to Spain as long as Franco was in power and he kept his word on that. This is a very powerful piece though. It's about 20 feet across, 10 feet tall, maybe even bigger, huge painting. And uh, it's his comments on war and evils of war. So not only were some artists reacting negatively to war, but also art can be used politically as propaganda. So in the Soviet era, uh, Stalinists and, and uh, Leninists produced a lot of art. Soviet artists made a lot of art, and mostly it's proclaiming you know, the glories of communism under their rule, which of course was a facade. It wasn't so good. Here's Papa Joe himself. The youth of Russia, inspiring the youth of Russia. This guy actually is a mass murderer responsible for about 40 million people dying. Horrible guy. So this is putting spin on it, you know, make Russia great again. <laughs> and and on, the other side of the, on the other side of the world, the same thing's going on in China. This is the, the great chairman Mao leading the masses. This is... Uh, Another one where the, the Chinese workers are going to create, they're going to build their own world. We're going to build a communist paradise here in China. So these posters are all to try to get everybody working hard to create a new country. It actually worked pretty well. China, China did become a modern country rather quickly. And in spite of all the horrible oppression and evil ways they did it, they were able to become a modern society. And this one I threw in just because whoever this propaganda artist is, he had a good sense of humor. If you look at this, the last girl in line here, her clothes are a little transparent. If you look close, this is uh, maybe red propaganda, or red pornography, I'm not sure. It's just kind of interesting picture, you know. Maybe, maybe if you are a good fighter for the revolution, you'll get benefits. <laughs> Over in Germany, we had the Berlin Wall, you know, where Stalin and his buddies decided to block the eastern half of Germany, which they had taken in World War II from the western half, which the United States and England and France had. So they built this huge wall, dividing their whole city in, 
in half and people lived on one side hated it and people lived on the other side were happy with it this is from the western side where you can see that young germans have painted up the wall with all kinds of decorations and on the other side you have the soviet troops patrolling so nobody's going to escape and this this one here shows a mural the various ways when people would try to get over or under or around this wall to come from the east to the west so we've got a guy jumping over and another guy tunneling underneath and this guy's happily peeing on the the guard station where they would watch everybody so they're kind of like let's get out of here you guys and it, it eventually happened. Here's what the German people really wanted. They wanted to be with each other and eventually this wall got torn down literally by the people. They just, one day they decided they'd had enough. The Russians didn't really care enough anymore so they actually literally got out their jackhammers and tore this thing down. After the fall of the Soviet Yeah, well I wouldn't say the, after, it split up a little bit. But yeah, but they decided they weren't gonna try to keep everybody prisoner anymore and nowadays Germany is re reunified. So things, there was a positive outcome. So we talked a little bit earlier about the culture war and the hippie mesmerizing the young girl and stuff. It, it goes back a long ways. This is John D. Rockefeller Jr. and he commissioned, he commissioned Diego Rivera, the famous Mexican muralist, to create this piece in the Rockefeller Center. Diego painted it, but if you look close down here, we've got Lenin and Karl Marx is in there somewhere. And John D. Rockefeller was a capitalist. This upset him so much that he paid Rivera what his fee was and then hired a whole crew to paint this thing over. Wow. So it was completely destroyed. But the Mexican government thought it was cool enough that they gave him a big wall in their, <coughs> in their uh, Institute of Bellas Artes. Mexico City where he painted it again so if you go to Mexico City <laughs> you can go see this piece so there's that's kind of the start of where you know capitalism and politics we're gonna censor an artist or keep him from being himself and so even though they paid him and hired him this is Jesse Helms used to be a senator in North Carolina and I don't know where how Aunt Jemima got in here but he was an evil evil racist but he had a personal vendetta against this one artist, Judy Chicago. And this is her, this is her piece, The Dinner Party, which about a thousand women worked on. It's, uh, her issues were feminist issues. And she wanted to celebrate the famous women of the world, so she invited them all to a dinner party. And to make the place settings and everything, she invited about a thousand women to create the plates and the dinnerware and the place settings and the, the place mats are all embroidered. It's a beautiful piece. But old Jesse Helms actually had Senate hearings against this artist and was threatened to defund anybody that would support her or give her grants that they would immediately lose their federal funding. So he had a personal vendetta with, with Judy. <clears throat> this is Attorney General John Ashcroft, Ashcroft from the first Bush administration. No, you the first time. Ashcroft, well, anyway. He was so upset about, about the Statue of Justice in the background that he spent 10 or 20 grand of taxpayer money to create special curtains to hide her because he didn't want to be photographed like this with bare boobs in the background. That was too much for him. So he spent our, all our taxpayer money hiding this thing. So to sum up this part, you know, things get censored, it's stupid. Things still get censored on Facebook, it's still stupid. <laughs> Especially, you know, boobs for some reason are like the, the, the cutting edge on Facebook. So I, I, I wanted to keep this short, but there's guys that you can go cut out male boobs and stick them on your girl Facebook picture so that if they say, well, you can't show this because there's female breasts involved. No, no, these were from men. We, we got these nipples off men. But anyway, it's still going on. But to sum up this little section, really, we, sh we should fear no art. Art, art, is, yeah. art is good and, and you know, fear no art, fear governments that ban art. That's, that's really how it is. Art, we're, we're here to enlighten people and, and, and make y'all feel good and wake you up and, and show you the truth and there's nothing to be afraid of there unless you're doing something bad to begin with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one of the things if you're any kind of political artist, 
we want to take back our world. We, you know, we have to, you know, this is our, this is our world too. You know, we own this place, and and so we need to act like it. So yeah, we're not here to be polite. We're here to make some statements. <clears throat> So some of the artists around have been doing that. This is Shepard Fairey, who's well known for all kinds of stuff and a big, a big success in the art world. But he started out as a street artist, sticking up little stickers here and there of his pieces until finally he got a little recognition and then he got a little more money and then he could build, get a bigger studio. He worked up to being one of the big boys now, but he still has kept his political roots. So this is the flowers and the barrels of gun. A direct, a d direct reference to the picture I showed earlier of the young man putting the flower in the gun barrel. He got hired by the Obama uh, campaign to do some Obama posters, you know, expressing our hope that this guy was going to do us right. Well, it didn't work out entirely right, so he had to do another version <laughs> of when oh, the uh, Occupy folks came around. So he did, he did the uh, Guy Fox here. And the Occupy movement in general was a great thing for artists it gave us some political stuff to talk about the occupy guys opened an art gallery right across from the stock exchange in new york city if graffiti changed anything it would be illegal so they were big inspirations for a lot of different art and posters so occupy wall street occupy sisterhood occupy the streets Occupy is gone now, or it's evolving into the next thing. It's not gone. So the reason it was there is still here. You know, rich people have everything and poor people have nothing. And we would like to have a little more balance in our world because if nobody's, if we, if if, if somebody's missing out, there's going to be a little anger and resentment. So if everybody's, if we're all sharing everything, and have a little equality amongst these things, then we're all going to feel good, and and we're not going to fuss and fight with each other so much. That's right. So occupying the streets, they have the museum of the streets. This is worldwide. There's all kinds of street art going on. And I'm going to show a few examples. This is one of the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, which is a slum where the poorest people live. So it started out like this, but then some artists got together and got a little money and financed painting up the houses, brighten up these people's lives a bit. Here's a little close up picture. So this, this has kind of taken off in the whole world where a lot, of, a lot of slums all over the world have been doing decorating and stuff like this. Here's another example. A photographer known as J.R. goes around to these communities, meets the people, the local people, takes pictures of them, blows them up to giant size, and puts them on the walls in their homes. Here's another one, a stairway in one of these favelas. It looks very nice and Japanesey, but it's actually in the midst of a big slum. <clears throat> Over in Yemen, where right now there's a horrible war of starvation going on, and women are very repressed, but a few brave souls will actually get out with their paintbrushes and paint something about love, even in the midst of a big war and while they're being starved to death. Here's another picture. This one's from Kabul in Afghanistan, where it's not too different, uh, where these women are bravely getting out. Women aren't supposed to express themselves in any way there. So these ones, are they're risking their lives, actually, to go out and paint these murals. Here's another one. And here's one of our brave artists here. And the, what she's showing behind her is very taboo. You can see the woman's hair. And she's carrying a symbol of music. And music was forbidden there by the Taliban who are ruling the place. And so she's, she's a taboo-breaking woman there, you know, cutting edge in a society that's horribly repressive. Another famous street artist is Banksy. He's known for all kinds of shenanigans, but he does wonderful political art. So here's the, the army is being patted down instead of the other way. And mm -hmm. here, instead of throwing a bomb, he's throwing flowers. And this guy wants change. He doesn't want money. He wants change. And here we have some soldiers, you know, tacitly saying, "Hey, we don't want to fight or kill people. We're gonna, we're gonna guard." <laughs> He's the one guy's guarding the other guy so he can get the peace sign painted on the wall. Mr. Banksy pulls all kinds of crazy, big mega stunts. He created this place called Dismal Land mm -hmm. over in England. He rented out an abandoned lot and created this whole fake Disneyland where things just aren't quite right. <laughs> he went to the, he went to the West Bank and rented out or bought this building, and called it the Walled Off Hotel. 
<laughs> so you can actually go there and rent a room and hang out upstairs and here's the wall right on the other side between Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. So you can look over the wall from the upper rooms and see guard towers and empty land and the whole kind of barren thing. This is his comment that if you want to actually go experience life in an oppressed place, you can go stay in the walled off hotel. And go online, you can book a room, it's, it's there. Another really cool thing that's happened that's kind of related to street art is, is a warehouse revival where warehouses and big <laughs> empty commercial spaces are lying around, you know, as Walmarts go out of business or Sears and Roebuck. What are you going to do with these big box stores? How can they be utilized for something cool? Well, these guys called the Meow Wolf Collective, a couple hundred artists, managed to get some dot com -er guy to give them a couple million bucks and they bought an old bowling alley down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And meow here, wolf? Meow Wolf. Like, Meow Wolf. <laughs> That, that they they put words in a hat and picked out the words and the ones they got were meow and wolf so that's that that's how they that's how they came up with their name so here here's the interior of the space under construction and here's some more under construction and here's how it looks finished <laughs> they, the whole inside is like this crazy fun house place built by artists and it was so successful you know they charged 20 or 30 bucks to go in this place and spend the day and they pulled in about seven or eight million dollars last year, which they divide amongst their members. So in terms of artists creating a viable way to live and survive and do their art, this was a big success. It was so successful, they're opening another one up in Denver. Here's a couple more, another picture of the inside. So you can go in this place and wander around all day and just enjoy the weird stuff. So another thing that's going on with political art, this is found on the internet in the what are called memes. I'm just going to show a couple. But this one meant a lot to me because I went to UC Davis. And on UC Davis, these Occupy kids were sitting on a sidewalk, occupying the sidewalk. They weren't really blocking anybody. And this officer, John Pike, decided he could come up and pepper spray them all in the face. And this is, this is the real photo of him doing this. And so people immediately took this on the internet and made all kinds of memes about him. And there's, there's dozens more. I could only have space, <laughs> space for a few. <laughs> Officer Pike lost his job and the students sued the city and got themselves a bunch of money. And Officer Pike sued the city for firing him and he got a bunch of money too. So I don't know how this all works out. But anyway, he, he was kind of a kind of a jerk here spraying everybody, but <laughs> it, it went, it went, Jesus, it went, it went as viral as can be. Here's a few more memes. Here's a couple on our president. So uh, what, basically what this is, is you can pick anything you want, put some words on it, post it up on your social media. And if you strike the right chord, it's, everybody's going to share it. It's going to go around the world and people are going are to see what it is you were trying to say. Here's another one. Mr. Trump, where humor is involved. <clears throat> and some of my own work has, this has happened too. So here's, here's a, a nice example. I found my work with swastikas on it from neo-Nazis in Germany too. So this one is a quote from Terence McKenna. The artist's task is to save the soul of mankind. If artists cannot find the way, the way cannot be found. Eh, maybe so, maybe not, I don't know. I don't know if we have that special quality, but perhaps. So while we're on the Trump subject, I couldn't resist this part. It's a mad, 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 mad world, Mad Magazine. They, their famous satire magazine, of course, is still around. They, they really, uh, Trump provided them with all kinds of stuff to make some humor and satire out of. So here's one of them and here's another one. Alfred E. Newman, the mascot for Mad, here is one of those reporters that Trump doesn't like so much. And they actually have the Mad Art Gallery. They created their special Trump Art Gallery, so famous masterpieces with Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the and Andrew Wyeth's famous picture, <laughs> reworked. <laughs> Trump, Trump's bewildered and lost on the golf course. Or Trump taking the ship of state across the Delaware, only it's Niagara Falls. Yes. And so those are from Mad Magazine. Here's a couple more I happen to like. <coughs> this is just grab them by the, you know what? And 
This one, uh, artist Ilma Gore, a woman artist from England, painted this one. <laughs> and this one got enough attention that somebody like attacked her in her car and <gasps> punched her and stuff and kind of beat her up. But that didn't stop her. She's still doing this stuff. And this picture became very famous. She probably got a lot of money for it, I hope. But it went really viral, but not for long because they had to censor him, of course. Even though he wasn't showing his nipples, he was showing that other little thing. And, and so you would see this on Facebook with a little black square there, you know. Censoring Trump, you might as well go the whole hog if you're going to censor him. Block him out completely. <laughs> So, uh, an artist, Mark oh. Bryan, he's from around here. Uh, he, he does a lot of politically subject art. So here's the Trump octopus taking in all the politicians and clowns. Isn't that an old thing? This picture's been around, well, a year and a half now. No. Well, I mean, just the octopus. It was an old political Oh, yeah, thing. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The octopus as like the... Yeah, from the, I guess, the turn of the century. Right, because the uh, political combines or Tammany Hall in New York City. Yes. Yeah. It was shown as an octopus occasionally. So he took that theme to modern times. This one, I couldn't find who the artist was, but I, this is Trailer Trash Trump. And it's, it's really nice. There's Melania in the background there by the trailer. The dog's taking a dump. And he's got all his stuff on, his bling, rich white trash tattooed on his shoulder and all that good stuff. Some artists did a great job on this one. Yeah. And of course here in San Francisco and other cities, these fiberglass statues magically appeared one day. And they didn't last very long or the cops took them away, but here in the city, it actually stuck around a few days. And of course, people here know what to do with a statue like that take selfies of course so this this black lady's <laughs> taking advantage of the situation and having some fun with them this this idea still lives just recently these started popping up all around new york city for people walk their dogs on the streets there and so this these are for like dogs to relieve themselves on and that hundreds of these popped up around new york city <laughs> so one of the other ways we can take back our world advertising it's very pervasive it's all over the place it, it's really bothersome it's hard to get away from it's almost impossible to get away from somebody's always trying to sell you something so Mr. Banksy had a comment about this, and I'm going to read it to you. It'll take a couple minutes. People are taking the piss out of you every day. They butt into your life, take a cheap shot at you, and then disappear. They leer at you from tall buildings and make you feel small. They make flippant comments from buses that imply you're not sexy enough and that all the fun is happening somewhere else. They are on TV making your girlfriend feel inadequate. They have access to the most sophisticated te technology in the world has ever seen, and they bully you with it. They are the advertisers, and they are laughing at you. You, however, are forbidden to touch them. Trademarks, intellectual property rights, and copyright law mean that advertisers can say what they like, whenever they like, with total impunity. Fuck that. Any advert in a public space that gives you no choice, whether you see it or not, is yours. It's yours to take, rearrange, and reuse. You can do whatever you like with it. Asking for permission is like asking to keep a rock somebody just threw at your head. You owe these companies nothing, less than nothing. You especially don't owe them any courtesy. They owe you. They have rearranged the world to put themselves in front of you. They never ask for your permission. Don't even start asking for theirs. Mm -hmm. So in response to such an attitude, there's a character in New York City where for 20 bucks you can mail away for one of these keys. That's what these things are. And these keys open up like bus stop boxes where they put the advertising. So if you want one for San Francisco, you can say, I live in San Francisco, here's my 20 bucks. They send you a key, you can create your own posters and go around to the Muni bus stops and put your own art in there. <clears throat> so he sold these at a couple of art fairs where you could just buy them right off the shelf. Here's advertising shits on your head. Here's where somebody <laughs> did this. And here's a couple of people doing it, and they put on their orange vests so they look like they're city workers, so nobody will question them while they're out about their business. And taking this idea a little further, another group, uh, city buses, have all the advertising around the tops of the city buses. So here they're telling you it's okay to do it. Removing, replacing, and defacing advertising is not vandalism. And in the next one, they actually tell you how to do it. <laughs> here's, here's your instructions. <laughs> So here's what a city full of advertising looks like, Times Square in New York, and 
well, it's kind of pretty in a way. It's actually a bunch of crap. You know, they're trying to sell you stuff. Everybody's trying to sell you shit. Well, Sao Paulo and Brazil, they banned all, pretty much all outdoor advertising and big signs on stores and all that stuff. So here's, here's their city today. Looks a little gray, but if you look close, here's a before and after picture. It looks a lot nicer, doesn't it? But they didn't want to be completely gray, so they started up a lot of public art projects where they actually pay and hire street artists to do big, grandiose things. So this is the, the museum of the street where under the freeways, each, each little piece of cement is painted over. Or they hire people to do big buildings. Here's you know, a 20, 30 story building. This artist is Eduardo Cobra does these. He actually does this around the world now. This one I particularly like by a woman artist, Mona Karen. The plants living on the side of a concrete building in the concrete jungle. So the people of Sao Paulo have, have got the right idea that they can decorate their city the way they want instead of letting advertisers tell them how they're going to do it. <clears throat> so here's some contemporary artists I'm going to show you that all are working with political subjects. <clears throat> and they are, this one is by Guy Colwell. And he showed this piece in a little gallery over off Columbus Avenue, down there in, uh, in San Francisco, North Beach. The owner was Chinese. She put this picture in her gallery and some guy was so offended that he actually beat her up. And she was so scared by this, she closed her gallery. So, so this wasn't what Mr. Colwell intended, of course, but, but the art was strong enough to evoke this kind of reaction. That, who can say? He did this one also. Uh, this is our ravers and partiers, you know, partying on while all around them, all this horrible urban tragedy is going on. <clears throat> so this is, you know, this is a, a call to the youth of, today, of today to wake up and uh, put down the drugs and booze and maybe turn the music down on occasion and start taking care of business. Another artist friend of mine, Russell Bruchet from Santa Cruz, does a lot of politically themed art. So this is Jesus in righteous anger, throwing the money changers out of the temple. And uh, so even, even Jesus, it's okay to get mad a little and protest sometimes. There's another one, a post-apocalyptic world where McDonald's is a wreck and uh, the uh, Native Americans have come back to their way of life. Another street artist I like a lot is Mir One. He lives down in LA and these, he does mostly spray can art. So these are big murals on the sides of buildings down there. This one. And here's another one, kind of on an Iwo Jima theme. You're raising the flag over a pile of garbage. And here's another real, this is one of his later pieces. Here's a revolution in Washington, D.C. They're tearing up the police van and uh, Department of Homeland Security, and they're burning the Capitol, and all kinds of good stuff. He's a wonderful painter, full of exciting images. Another one I like a lot is Ron English. He's from back in New York, but he used to live in LA. <clears throat> and Ron's known a lot for the defacing advertising. He's been arrested innumerable times. So he would, he would go find a billboard that was susceptible, look at what was on it, and then go back to his studio and make something appropriate that kind of wasn't noticed right away at first and go out in the middle of the night and paste this stuff up. So here's a couple more. Forever Cool and Camel Kids. And he also takes this idea occasionally to a retail store where he'll make these fake products and sneak them into the store and put them on the shelf. And you might go in there and uh, find a very interesting uh, new cereal to eat in the morning. <laughs> Sugar, sugar frosted smack, okay. Sugar coated fat, you know, and Captain Crunch's starch and all that kind of stuff. So this is, he's kind of a guerrilla artist, but he, he also is kind of, and he also likes to pick on McDonald's particularly. So here's Ronald McDonald after having a little too much McDonald's. Uh, yeah, he's a, he actually has built like big life-size ones and stuff too. Ron's a very meticulous artist. He also is a very fine painter, so here's some of our American icons reworked in a sarcastic kind of way. Great painter. 
good friend of mine and compadre, and we've done a lot of things together and exhibited together is Amanda Sage. And this piece is called Anna Suramai, and what this is a self-portrait, and this is depicting a situation where when the women of the world in various cultures get really fed up with poor behavior on the part of the men, they will lift their skirts and run at you and say, take it, the most powerful thing in the world, you came from here, deal with it. So this is her self-portrait doing this and she's dropping the egg on the Illuminati down here at their uh, corporate boardroom. So she was part of the Occupy LA movement so she made herself a little dolly and rack so she could take this thing to Occupy demonstrations in Los Angeles. <clears throat> so here she is on the streets at one of these. And she took it that same night, she took it to City Hall in LA and marched it up the steps. And the cops actually let her take it inside and stick it up right in the lobby for a while. And so she's a very brave soul. Another one of my favorite LA artists is this guy, Alex Schaefer, and he's, he's kind of a plain air guy. He's not really political very much. He usually just does local scenery. But one day he was out painting a bank and he decided he would burn the bank in his painting. <laughs> and it, it, it aroused curiosity from some spectators and one of them decided he was a terrorist, that he really was gonna burn down the bank. And so they called the police on him. They came and arrested him. He had to go to court. He proved in court that he was not a terrorist and that he was just a painter guy. And they let him go, dropped the charges, and of course all the fame and publicity made him well known, so he put the picture up on eBay and got about $30,000 for it. <laughs> Consequently, he painted a bunch more Burning Bank pictures. I hope he's doing good. <laughs> But I also have to say that Alex, Alex also liked to go with chalk and go out in front of these various banks and copy their logo in some sarcastic way on the sidewalk in front of the banks. The bank guards would come out and tell me, oh, you can't do this, we're going to arrest you, blah, blah, blah. And they did. But he went to court over that and proved that chalk on a sidewalk is not vandalism. It washes off with water. So he actually won the right for any of us to go out in front of a business we particularly despise and write whatever we want on the sidewalk out front and they can't do anything about it. So if you're feeling the urge, go for it. So here's another one by Mark Bryan, the guy that did the octopus picture. I got a couple more by him because they're, they're so timely. <laughs> Tell the bullshit, it's Steve Bannon's feeding it to old Trumpy there. And here's the ship of state going down, the politicians leaving like rats. And uh, here's another one, uh, Trump on stage being manipulated by the guy behind, the Trumpomatic. And I'm gonna end up here with my friend Jessica Perlstein. She lives here in the city. This is her vision of San Francisco of the future, where we're living sustainably with rooftop gardens and gardens in the streets. So, and she does a lot of book illustration for famous authors. Here's another one here, Revelation Revolution. And a positive picture showing different sides of like a, a happy culture of the future. Another famous artist we all know who touches on political subjects sometime, Alex Gray, he lives back in New York. He often does these romantic and cosmic and anatomical and spiritual, beautiful pictures, but occasionally he does some political stuff. So he did this one for Barack Obama as a political poster, and he also is a very much an advocate for psychedelics and how they can be used in healing ways. So this is his homage to uh, <coughs> um, the founder of LSD, Dr. Hoffman, and this is him holding his LSD molecule here in a very psychedelic way, and there's his, his retort, dripping the molecule out. So he, he's an unabashed advocate that using psychedelics made him the artist he is today. He's not ashamed to say this, which most artists are, if, the, if, if there was a big influence on them. Most of them are kind of scared that somebody will think badly of them if they admit it. But he's out very out front, uh, up, up, up front about it. And uh, another artist I respect a lot, his art isn't so great in my opinion, but he's a street artist in San Francisco, or in uh, New York. He sells his stuff down there in Greenwich Village on the streets. And he had a running battle with Rudy Giuliani when Giuliani was mayor there, where he'd been arrested at least 30 times, having his art seized, his friend's art seized, burned, destroyed by the cops. He's back the next day. 
personal vendetta from Giuliani to him, but he, he decided to lawyer up and got some legal representation donated and battled for the right to show and sell art on the streets of New York City all the way to the federal courts next to the Supreme Court. And they ruled in his favor every time. So he won this personal war with Mayor Giuliani on the, on, for the benefit of all artists. So if any of you go to New York City and want to stick something up on a wall somewhere or show some things and even sell them, you can do it, as long as you're not blocking the road or creating a nuisance. Some other street art I like a lot. This is the book tank. So you can, you can uh, if this shows up in your neighborhood, you can take a book or two, and they won't, they won't shoot you. They'll encourage you. And this is the seed bomb dispensing machine. So you put your quarter, 50 cents in, and you get a little seed bomb that you can go stick in the ground somewhere, and it'll grow some lovely flowers or herbs. And greening up our cities is one of the things we want to do. So here's a painted green city. But some people are doing the real thing. So here's a archway over a freeway or something that's covered with living plants. Here's another example where someone made a beautiful garden or in a public park, mm. some nature as sculpture, very beautiful pieces. So we all like to live in a place where people do this instead of burn and blow it up. Okay. So this last part here, I'm gonna talk about me a little bit. <laughs> Images to inspire art intended to foment an evolution of social consciousness. And these are by me. So here's one of my this is, we just went through an election cycle. So our freedom, is it protected by cops? Or are they taking it away? Do we need their protection? I, I was inspired by this when the cops chased out all the people from one of the Democratic caucus meetings where the, the, they weren't liking the way it was going. So the, the conservative Democrats had the, the cops chase out the more radical ones. <clears throat> so that inspired me to make this picture. This is my first real political piece called Illusion of Reality. It's all about the drugs and the drug war and stuff. And this, this poor soul is, he's dreaming of the things he would like to be happy with, the things that are natural and make us happy without any kind of interference at all. Your, your wife or your, your mother, your lovers, your friends, you know, supportive adults, the beautiful nature, sunsets and flowers and butterflies and all that good stuff. It's free. We can enjoy those anytime. We don't need any money or anything to enjoy those beauties of nature. But instead, we created a world like this, full of all kinds of stuff that's not so nice. And so this poor guy, he's got plenty of stuff to get out of, just to get back to the, the natural things that make us feel good. He's willing to kill himself to do it. I wanted to understand the nature of addiction and people who would do themselves in, in the desire to try to feel good about life. You know, I, I, a few of my friends this happened to, and I don't quite understand the psychology, but I made this picture to try to get an understanding of, of what it is that makes these people the way they are. It's the outside world, the world we created. It's so horrible, how can you relate sometimes? This I made during Bush War I, the first Iraq war, and uh, it's kind of a cause and effect, or maybe it's an effect and a cause kind of picture, depending on how you read it. We have the American family sitting around the TV cheering on the war machine, which is actually run by rich guys like Dick Cheney and their industrial machine polluting the world and filling it up with crap so he can make some money. And the outcome of this and our dependency on oil and petroleum products, we're gonna go over to countries across the world and blow people up so we can take it for ourselves. So this is, they're cheering on the missiles landing and hit, they had cameras mounted on the tips of the missiles so you could actually watch this in real time. A missile go in on some place and blow somebody up. So that's what they're doing and on this side is what it actually looks like. Not so pleasant. I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, not hold back because, you know, how we, uh, how this whole machine works, it's, it's really bad. So here's our guy. He's got his toys on top there, his stock certificates, his cocaine, his weapons, you know, his communications, his rockets, and plenty of money. And here's the outcome of these wars. It's still going on. I was talking about Yemen. We're having battles to this day about this in Syria. So it, it hasn't gone away, and this is, what, this is what it really is. You know, innocent people get killed in horrible ways. It's, it really upsets me. <clears throat> so here's our American family. 
Woohoo! Yeah, we got everything. We're watching TV. It's great. America first. Yeah, right. <clears throat> this one's called March of Progress. I want to comment on our natural world being destroyed by various forms of human development, if that's what you want to call it, or our human nature destroying machine here is in the background. And it's, it's coming forward to chew up the world. And here's some of our animal brothers and sisters and a, a mom and her baby too, fleeing from this thing like any sensible being would. This one is called Sharing the Wealth. And I wanted to comment about how the rich people who have everything don't like to share, but maybe they didn't like their burger that day, so they toss it out the window. And we've got our Poor people on the other side of the world will take whatever they can get. This poor starving woman, you know, she's actually competing with a dog here to get a bite to eat. And in her world, there's plenty of people that are working, or, but there's plenty of beggars and starving. It's run by capitalists. The army's in the background there to make sure everybody stays in line. Yeah, sharing the wealth, something we should do. Here's a, the uh, rich people side of things. So kind of Las Vegasy and Hollywoody and all this glitz and glamour and stuff. And over here is more the reality for most of the world's population. So this, this, the other side is built on this side. And these people suffer because of it. I wanted to comment. This one is called um, <clears throat> Wheel of Fortune. And this is, this is um, talking here about how we are consumers. We're given all these false desires you know, sex and money and drugs and a nice home and stuff to drink and plenty of food and all the things we're supposed to work hard for. And in reality, the guys up in the upper left are the control, they got their hands on the lever, they're smoking cigars and drinking champagne and pulling on the lever saying, let's see how fast we can make this guy run before he falls off the wheel and goes down the tubes and gets ground up by the machine. <laughs> and meanwhile, the machine is grinding up nature and churning out gold bricks for these guys to stick in their vaults. So this is, this is the Wheel of Fortune, and luckily as an artist I've been able to escape this reality. Not everybody's so lucky, but I, I would hope that we can find out what it is we really like in life and try to pursue that instead of false needs that we're told or need, we need to have. This one is called The Winner. <clears throat> it's about war in general. So. Say we have a big war, okay, we blew up everything, and I won, I'm the winner, here I am, celebrating, woohoo, I got everything, I won the war, but what did you win? It's all blown up, there's nothing good there left. Mm -hmm. And if you live in Syria, it's kind of how, they had a beautiful country, they had a, have been having a war for the last 10 years or so, they destroyed their whole, all their buildings, all their antiquities, their museums, mm -hmm. all, all the, their homes, it's all blown to hell now, and they have to rebuild the whole dang thing. And over what did they fight? I don't even know to this day, and I try to study this stuff. It's they're pro kind of a proxy war between big powers like Russia and the United States, but everybody else in there is mixed up, and religion, and you know, Israel, and Islam, and they're all, they just can't seem to figure out that what people really want is to hang out and you know, have something nice to eat and drink, and sell their crafts and have a little fun. So I was in Europe during the time of the big refugee crisis and had the chance to, to think about and start this picture. And so this is a refugee family fleeing the destruction of their homes. And the antique world are the beautiful things that are the heritage of humanity, the wonderful sculptures and statues from ancient days that are so well preserved there that religious fanatics decided to take jackhammers to or blow up with rockets. So the statuary and all the beautiful things are now in worse shape than ever. And any sensible person would want to just get the hell out of there. So th th these are refugees trying to leave their homeland and find a safer place. So this is the Holy Family. If you know your Bible history, Jesus and Mary and Joseph had to run out of, out of the Holy Land to Egypt because they were being oppressed by the Romans and were gonna, they were gonna kill all the male babies, so they had to run. So they were the original Holy Family, but this is a Holy Family too. It's any of us trying to just run away from oppression and, and danger to a better life. So here's our family.
this picture I made as kind of a reflection, of, you know, looking at places like Syria and the Middle East and, and everything that in spite of whatever we humans do, we could kill ourselves, but nature is going to persist. Our cities could go to ruin, we could be dead in the streets, but something's going to grow and eventually take over. So that's my optimistic nature here, rising up through all the wreckage. I also did a little series having to do with global warming and uh, in, th in, this, in this bit, the global warming has already occurred, the oceans are 40 or 50 feet higher, so this is New York City in front of the stock exchange, a view from the federal building across the way there to the front of the New York Stock Exchange. I figured that the uh, corporate types will realize global warming is a serious threat when they have to take a boat to get to work. So that's what this picture is all about. Yeah, but we, we've reconciled here. The boats are nice and it's all organized and the bridges between the buildings, so we're living with it. <laughs> this one is Washington, D.C., same story. This is a view from the Washington Monument looking towards the Capitol. So the National Mall, where all the demonstrations and stuff go on now, is underwater. And a few boats are crossing in front and there's a, a guy, well, I'll go back. There's a guy fishing right here off the Washington Monument and camping out there. This is the Lincoln Memorial, right around the corner from there. And the tourists are here in their gondola checking out the Statue of Abe and there's a, a, a mother swan and her babies are paddling across the foreground. <clears throat> so in the near future, maybe by 2050 or so, if we want to go see these things in DC, this might be how the way we get there to go see them. Uh, the same idea here in London. This is the Houses of Parliament where there's a big bridge there now. It's underwater. And, uh, and the lower stories of the Houses of Parliament are underwater. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is how London might look in the near future. A good friend of mine worked several summers as a tree planter and he inspired me to do this piece. This is called Restoring the Future. So this is also in the, in the not too distant future where there's, there's a, a city in the background where the people are living and this person is out planting trees. And the idea here is that we've lived, learned to live in harmony with nature. So the mama cat here is with her babies. She's an ocelot, in case you're curious. And she's a little wary of the humans you should be, but her babies are still able to play safe and the woman is able to plant the trees without fear that the cat's going to attack her or anything. And if you look close, they're on top of an old roadway. You can see the, the yellow line painted down the middle is there by, by her tail. And there's a couple of tires and engine blocks and other junk laying around in the bushes. They're kind of hard to see, but they're there. So here's, here's our tree planter. And here's our mama cat playing with her kittens. So hopefully in the future, if we do things right, we can, not, we can prevent the mass extinctions going on and, and live in harmony with our animal brothers and sisters, how it should be. This piece is called La Semillera. I named it in Spanish because it sounded better than in English. And she, she's a seed planter. She's, she's planting the seeds of culture. So here she is planting her seeds. And they're, they're growing up to become the arts and sciences. I hope I represented most of them in some way or another. It's a big painting, it's 10 feet across. It took me about a year to paint. This one is called Guardians of the Sacrament. And this is my comment on the Just Say No movement that Nancy Reagan started, where you're supposed to just say no to drugs. Well, that, that's ignorance. I, I said just say yes, let's learn. So this is a wise woman and her young pupil. And she's, today the lesson is mushrooms. And you're in the class two sitting across the mat from her and she's showing you the various things. And there's about 40 or 50 psychoactive plants in this picture. You can look through and find. So this is Guardians of the Sacrament. This one is called Paintbrush Warrior. And this is kind of a self-portrait in a way of what I do for my living is I use the powers of my art and painting and paintbrush to try to make a better world. So we're painting our way through the forces of oppression and darkness. So by using our powers of creativity, we can overcome these things and make a, a better, more colorful world. So here's the oppression, some bad things. And I, you can see there, I did a little tribute to Mr. Goya by putting his, his scenery right outside this guy's jail window. So it was kind of fun to throw that in as a little pun, kind of. 
So how we treat our own people, this guy did his duty, served his country, whatever it was he did, he did it, you know, with the best of intents, and when he gets home, they treat him like garbage, you know, live on the streets, you're a homeless guy, we're not going to do anything for you. So he's here begging for a little food, and, uh, you know, taking care of his little pet, and trying to survive on the streets of Washington, D.C., while prostitutes and politicians cruise around. He's got a Starbucks money. Kinda, yeah, I was playing with that idea. I didn't make it exact, just enough so a guy like you would think that. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this one here is called New Pioneers. This is probably my, my best known work. And I'm trying to show here the world as some people want it and the world how we could actually build it today if we chose. And so here on the left-hand side we have these people are in an active battle. They want to do this. They somehow think it's the right thing to do. They're blowing up their world and killing each other. And here's a more sensible person. She's decided to walk away from this, this young girl. She's got her stuff and she's getting the hell out of there. And some other refugees are coming up from this battle zone and they are, they've got their stuff with them, their tools and their children and the things they do, their musical instruments and their, their cooking implements and their carpentry tools, they're going to they're gonna cross over the ridge here at the crossroads and step into another world that they can create that's a better world. So here's, here's man at the crossroads here looking at the various things people have left on the wall as they pass by and going this way or that way. It's your choice, folks. So here's the positive side of this picture. So this is the world as we could actually build it today. I tried not to have anything too sci-fi or unrealistic. We could actually build a sustainable world powered by alternative energy where everybody's fed, and everybody has something to do and time to be creative. And my optimistic hope here is that in time we can build this world and have enough leisure time and happiness that we can all sit down together and enjoy the best things in life, like one big happy picnic. Mm -hmm. So here's my prayer for peace. And as my final note, I will say, artists, raise your weapons. The world cries out for meaningful, combative political art. It is our duty and responsibility to create a fierce, unyielding, aggressive culture of resistance. We must create art that exposes and denounces evil, that strengthens activists and revolutionaries, celebrates and contributes to the coming liberation of this planet from corporate, industrial, military, omnicidal madness. Artists and everybody else, pick up your weapons. Let's change things. Yeah. Thank you very much. So if anybody wants to ask me questions or anything like that, it's been a couple hours, you're probably kind of tired, but if, if you do want to, um, if anybody has anything they want to say or comment or talk amongst yourselves, this is the time to do that. I got a book. <laughs> okay, I talked to y'all out. Okay, yeah. How do you how do you remain optimistic in today's world? Can you repeat the question? Because I'm not on a mic. That's a really tough question. I you know I'm I'm seeing stuff going. You know it's kind of interesting because they say we only have ten more good years, and then it all goes to hell. And I, I'm I'm young enough that I might get to see the world totally crash and burn. That's pretty exciting. But on the other hand, there's a lot of human misery involved in that, and I don't want to see that. I've never been in a war, you know, I haven't had to shoot anybody, uh, you know, or, or, or spill anybody's blood, and I, I don't want to do those things, and you probably don't either. So, yeah, I have to be optimistic. What choice do I have? If I wasn't optimistic, well, I'd have to kill myself and take a bunch with me, you know, or something. I, I don't want to do that. It's not the right way to go. So, and I, I, I do believe that there is still maybe enough time that if we, hopefully, if we could turn the world over to 15-year-old kids from Sweden who have the right idea and let them run the show, maybe we could get somewhere good in a hurry. I'm really hoping that'll happen. You know, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Our last round of elections, a couple young people got elected and kicked out some of those old guys and they have a lot of good ideas and if they're allowed to, if they don't get corrupted by the system and stay true to their, stick to their guns, so to speak, I think maybe we can make some positive changes. 
the U.S., uh, we're lagging way behind. The, a lot of the other countries of the world are already getting way ahead on this uh, with sustainable ways to do things. Costa Rica just, um, all of their electricity is produced sustainably, so now they're working on getting all their vehicles electrical. You know, Sweden and Germany, most of their stuff is sustainable, so other countries are moving ahead. We're, we're stuck. You know, we're, we're still looking at coal. You know, that's, that's so, so 18th century. You know, we, we, and the sun is there giving us energy all the time, so I, I have to stay optimistic. I, well, the good part about coal is that nobody's buying it. Yeah, right, right. Economics, economics are gonna are gonna help here. I have one last quick question. Any advice for people who are starting out are artists or want to be an artist but are kind of afraid to be creative? Any any advice that you would share to people who are at the beginning of the artist journey? Don't be afraid. You know, it, all you need is a pencil and paper to start. You don't need any big equipment or any expensive stuff. You just have to have your imagination and the enough self-respect or where you. You feel enough that you can do things. You know, you, you know, you shouldn't hesitate. Just do it. There's, don't worry about if it's good or not or perfect or any of that stuff. Just express yourself. And the more you do it, the better you get. The more you do it, the more confident you are, and and eventually you can get there. So, uh, young artists, I meet a lot of them, and I, I usually want to encourage them to not, don't give up. You know, work hard and and be true to your dream and. Not everybody's going to get there, but you know sometimes dreams change too. You might start out wanting to be an art artist and end up being an architect. Who knows? But stay true to your dream. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming. Thank you.